Hello, everybody. Um, we're having technical difficulties up here. Apparently, someone came in and uh, deleted all the files for our slides. <laughs> I don't know if it was a sabotage job or what. But we have several options, so don't worry. I brought, I always bring overhead projector slides, so if worse comes to worse, we can go back to 20 year ago technology. Um, and also, um, Vivian's trying to get it emailed here, so we might get it up quickly. But there's several things we can start talking about before we even have slides um, that we don't need to have graphs for. Introduce the topic. Today we're gonna talk about competition. This is a bedrock concept in our, in our society. I think uh, the idea of democracy, democratic elections, and um, open competitive markets are essentially the bedrock of a free society. Um, we believe strongly in the advantages that are brought about through competitive markets. So the question is, what are those advantages? Why do we like competition so much? That's what our lecture is going to be about. Um, you will realize when we go through this lecture that competition is actually a lot more subtle and more strict than the general concept of competition in, in society. And there are many ways in which competition can fail um, and we need government interaction to try to, uh, intervention to try to fix things. So we're gonna be talking about that in future lectures. But today we're gonna talk about the ideal case of perfect competition and what benefits it brings about for the economy. Okay, um, also I think it's interesting, this is one of, remember in um, medieval times you had these alchemists who were always trying to change lead into gold? You remember that? Yeah, well this is as close as we've ever gotten to it, I think. The theory of competition, the understanding of competition. What happens here is we take base elements base concepts, consumers selfishly consuming whatever they want, firms selfishly generating as much profit as they can without regard to the consequences of it, and yet somehow all that selfishness goes together and creates a system that provides in some sense what's best for society as a whole. Yeah. It's as close to a miracle as I've ever come across. Um, so uh, it's truly amazing. And whenever we can harness this power, we want to be able to. Much of the analysis and the remainder of the class is going to be when we can utilize competition and when it's simply not possible to and we want to do other things instead. But whenever you can harness the power of competition, it's, it's truly an amazing force. Okay, so your first slide has um, conditions for competition. I wanted to talk about each of those for a bit. Um, the there are certain conditions that need to be met for competition to um, provide the benefits in the way that we're describing them. Okay? Some people call these assumptions. I don't like the idea that it's assumption because there's an idea that, because the assumption says, let's assume that. Um, the real question is, does a particular market have these conditions or not? You don't assume that it does. It, it either does or it doesn't. Your assumption is somewhat irrelevant to the reality of the situation. So you look for these conditions, and if these conditions are met, then the benefits of competition are brought about, can be brought about. Um, also, if they're not met in their entirety, you can, you can tell from our analysis that some of the benefits will still be able to be obtained. We wanna look at to what extent we can relax some of these conditions, have less, oh, there we are, thank you. <laughs> Some of the um, benefits of competition with um, uh, more general conditions that don't necessarily strictly meet these. Okay, so the first one is you need many small firms. Often this is stated as lots of firms, but the idea of numerous firms is not really the issue. Each of them needs to be small. So if you've got one large firm and lots of small firms, that's still lots of firms, but one firm that's large could dominate the market. The point here is no firm should think that it is able to control market price. So each firm has to be sufficiently small relative to the market such that no firm thinks or is actually able to control what goes on in the market. The second condition is homogeneous products. 
Um, this means the products are the same no matter which firm produces them. The consequence of this, and in a sense a way to define homogeneous products, is if one firm charges a higher price than another firm, nobody will buy from the higher priced firm because you can get exactly the same thing from the lower priced firm. So anything that would cause a person to continue to buy a product from a firm that's charging higher price than a competitor, that is an instance of non-homogeneous product. So for example, cars, obviously. Uh, we think of the uh, automobile industry as being highly competitive, but it's not competitive in the way that we're using the term today. It's, it's uh, in ways that we're going to discuss in the future. It's not a purely competitive market. Because um, Toyota can raise its price, and people are going to still buy some, you know, some Toyotas. Everyone won't switch immediately to get a Honda instead. Um, so um, it's possible for each firm to raise its price and not lose all its customers. With homogeneous product, any firm that raised its price of, uh, higher than the competitors would simply lose all its customers. Um, what's an example of this? As you go down these, con these um, conditions, it seems less and less uh, general in that it's actually rare to see a purely competitive market in, in the real world. One example is agricultural products, wheat. My uncle was a wheat farmer. My father grew up on a wheat farm and his brother took it over. And wheat is wheat, you know? If one farmer tries to charge more for, their, for his wheat, um, no one's going to buy it from them, you know, if you can buy it down the road for less. And so it's uh, lots of small firms creating wheat, homogeneous product. Third one is free entry and exit. Entry means that firms can enter the industry. Exit refers to when they then choose to leave the industry and go into some other line of business, perhaps. Free entry and exit does not mean it doesn't cost anything to enter or leave the industry. It has a very specific meaning. So when you enter an industry, if you want to be a wheat farmer, you have to buy land, you have to buy machinery, you have to have costs that are set up to do that. So it's not free entry in the sense of costless. What is meant here is that any firm that enters can then leave the industry and recoup whatever costs it incurred in entry. So if the firm has to buy land, buy machinery to enter the industry, the firm can then leave the industry, sell the land, sell the machinery minus the depreciation, the amount that it used of the machinery for the period it was operating. So essentially what this means is that firms can freely enter and leave. There's no sunk cost in it that um, cannot be um, recouped on exit. Um, this is an extremely important point. Most people don't even think about this as an aspect of competition, but as we'll see, Many of the benefits of competition come from the ability to fir of firms to enter the industry and leave when, when, when they choose to and recoup whatever the entry costs were. Um, and then the last one is that all firms face the same technology or, if you want to state, the same costs. So each firm has access to inputs at the same prices as all other firms. So there's no disadvantage that any firm faces relative to inputs. Um, Free entry and exit and same costs means that any firm that enters an industry is essentially on the same footing as a firm that had already been there. So the firms that enter an industry early have no advantage relative to those that enter late. They can, um, the ones that enter late incur the same cost as those who enter um, early. And um, since the product's homogeneous, customers would just as soon buy from them as anyone else. So. Um, you uh, have no advantage from the sequencing of firms entering or leaving the, the industry. So these are the conditions. Now, how does this play out for market forces? There's two essential interrelated questions. One is, how does each individual firm behave in this industry? And then how does the market price in the industry get established? So I want to look at the first of those two first, and then turn to the second. So I want to first look at the firm's choice of output. Since the firm is small, 
the firm is going to take the price of the output, the price of the product is given. We'll know that there's nothing I can do to affect it. That means that all the firm is actually choosing is how much to produce. They're not choosing a price because the price is given. So suppose we have the market price at some level. Let's say it's P1 or whatever. We're going to talk later about how this price is set. But to differentiate the pedagogical steps of the argument, I want to say, suppose the price is given. What does the firm then do in response to that price? The most important thing to recognize about the firm's decision process is that from the individual firm's perspective, the demand curve for its product, that is, the number of product, um, 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 quantity of goods that it could sell at any given price, um, is a flat line. It's a flat demand curve that's just uh, at the given market price. Now this should be a little confusing. What does it mean that at P1 all of these quantities are the quantity demanded? The easier way to think about it, or the more profound way to think about it, is at any price above P1, no one's going to buy from this firm. And so the demand for this firm's product is actually zero. So you could kind of mark in that as being the demand curve for a price above zero. For a price, I mean price below, above P1. For a price below P1, everyone in the entire world will buy from this firm because it's now the cheapest firm out there. And no one will buy from the other, other ones. That means that for any price below here, the quantity that d is demanded of this firm's product is so enormous, it's just way off the chart and is irrelevant to this firm because it can't, an individual firm being small in the market, can't provide all of the market demand. This line is simply the straight line that, denote, that connects the zero and the extremely large. Another way to look at this is you have a demand curve that is downward sloping, indicating, uh, and the, the steepness of it indicates how responsive people are. If it's very steep, people don't respond much to price. As it gets less steep, respond more to price. This is an extreme where there's an infinite response to price. Any price increase reduces quantity down to zero. Okay. So that's another way to look at it. And then a third way to look at it is, at any price, the firm can sell as much as it wants to and be able to have that amount demanded, find buyers for it. So any quantity that the firm wants to sell, given its capacity not to meet the whole market, but up to the total market, um, it, it would be able to sell. So those are three alternative ways of looking at this flat demand curve. Now, given that the firm recognizes that its demand curve is flat, it might not think about it this way. I'm sure my uncle didn't think about it this way. My uncle just thought, oh, there's a price. How much do I want to produce? Um, and the thought process that he went through is exactly what we're going to step through. But we like to think about it as a flat demand curve because it unifies it with all the other concepts we use. And it is a, 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 you know, a, a correct device. It's just uh, a formalization of the more informal procedure. So what does the firm do? The firm has a marginal cost curve that tells it how much does it cost to produce an extra unit of the good, given whatever it is producing already. And the firm will simply decide how much to produce by walking along this marginal cost curve, comparing price to marginal cost at every step, and stopping when it's no longer advantageous to expand production. So my uncle will decide how much wheat to produce in a given year, compare the cost of producing a small amount of wheat uh, an extra unit when it's already producing a small amount, with the price say, oh, I can sell it for more than it costs me to produce it, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. So then it produces more wheat, or decides he decides to produce more wheat, and then should I produce even more? Well, my costs are a little higher now because I'm having to use the less efficient parts of, or less, less fertile parts of my farm, um, but I can still sell it for a price that exceeds the, the cost that I've got. And it continues making that decision, expanding output until it gets to here. At that point, the price is exactly equal to the marginal cost, and so the firm has no reason to go any further. He would 
in a sense, if he were up here, he would say, well, what is my marginal cost? Well, it's above my price, and so I should cut my production. I'd make money by not producing this last unit because the cost of producing it exceeds the price I can sell it for. What that means is the firm essentially moves to the point where marginal cost is equal to price. This is a crucial element of competition. Whoops. That um, the firm chooses a quantity at which its price, the price that it faces, is equal to marginal cost. Now, many people say that a competitive firm prices at marginal cost because the price is equal to marginal cost. That is correct in a narrow sense in that the price is equal to marginal cost, but is stated in, an, in a slightly incorrect fa fashion. It implies that the firm is choosing a price and chooses a price that's equal to marginal cost. The firm is not choosing a price. The price is given to the firm. The firm is choosing a level of quantity at which its marginal cost is equal to its price. So the better way to put it is the firm is choosing a marginal cost level, implicitly choosing a level of quantity, that equals price rather than pricing at marginal cost. But you can use the shorthand pricing at marginal cost if you want to as long as you realize they're not actually choosing the price. They're choosing quantity. Notice how placid this competitive firm is. We think of competition as a kind of rough and ready, each firm trying to steal the other cu firm's customers. There is none of that going on here. Each firm's just taking prices given and deciding how much to produce. You might have Toyota trying to steal Honda's customers and cus Honda trying to steal Toyota's customers. That's because each of them has the ability to raise their price a little bit or lower their price a little bit and, um, and um, transfer customers from one to the other. Here there's no, re no ability to raise your price because as soon as you raise your price, you, um, the firm loses all their customers. And there's no incentive to lower the price because you can sell as much as you want to at the given price. Why sell at a lower price if you can sell as much as you want to at the given price? So my uncle gets together with his fellow farmers and they maybe complain about the price, but they don't try to steal each other's customers. They simply take their wheat to the local, um, what's it called? The silo, uh, where you deposit your wheat and sell it, um, and, and sells it. So each of them is just deciding every year how much they want to produce, and they don't compete with each other in, this, in the common sense of compete. So this market is actually much more peaceful than what people think of as a competitive market. A purely competitive market is, uh, uh, there's really not uh, uh, antagonism or, or, or an attempt to undermine each other between the um, competitors. And if that's happening, then it's actually a sign of market power, as we'll show in the future. Now, that's how a firm operates. As I said, let's take prices given, and we uh, then determine how the firm is going to react to that. Now I want to say, okay, how is the price in the market determined? And to do this, I'm going to look at two stages of analysis. In reality, both of these stages occur simultaneously. I'm dividing the two stages because it's extremely useful pedagogically to see the forces that are going on. The first stage is what I'm defining as there's a fixed number of firms in the industry. So there's a certain number of firms, say 100 firms, 1,000 firms, whatever there are, okay? And that's fixed. So I'm not allowing entry or exit. And then in stage two, I'm allowing entry and exit. The reason for this division is because I want to show what aspects of competition arise simply because you have a lot of firms independent of entry and exit, okay? That's stage one and what aspects of competition arise because of free entry and exit. So this breaking it into two stages allows us to differentiate where the forces are coming from and what's causing each of them. Because sometimes you will have free entry and exit, but not a lot of firms. And so you want to see what happens from free entry and exit. Sometimes you'll have 
uh, not these aren't purely competitive markets, but you'll have a quasi-competitive market that has a lot of firms, but not entry and exit. Okay, and you want to know how that would play out. So by seeing how each of these forces play out, it's important. Now, one important thing uh, in your book on the discussion of competition, there is a distinction between long run and short run. How many of you have seen that? Yes. Long run and short run is an important distinction, but it's a different distinction than I'm making here. Each of these distinctions is utilized to um, elucidate some concepts. I'm trying to elucidate what is the uh, impact of having lots of firms versus having firms enter and leave. That's what my stage one and stage two are. Short run and long run are... Who wants to tell me what the long run is? When we're all dead. <laughs> long run is when a firm is able to in, uh, change all of its inputs, including its factory size, capital size, amount of land that it owns. Short run is when some inputs are fixed, such as a farm has a certain number of acres of land and can't expand, um, or has a certain amount of factory and can't um, change the size of the factory. So the short run is when at least one input is fixed for the firm, and the long run is when all inputs vary. And it's very, uh, the book will point out to you how s there's important distinctions that occur in those two kinds of situations, and they relate to each other in a particular way. Mm. That is important. This, I think, is even more important. And um, I want to make sure that you don't confuse it with what's going on in the book. Now, the first thing in either of these two st analyses when we're looking at markets is to relate the firm to the market. I have found that it's useful, the way I like showing it, is to always in a competitive market have two graphs. One that's the market, which is the total quantity produced in the market, this is Q, capital Q, and then an individual firm since all the firms are the same, they have the same costs, duh, then uh, they're all small relative to the market, we, don't, we can just have one firm listed here as a representative example of all firms. And this is the quantity that it produces. The important thing is to put them next to each other horizontally because then the price in the market can be read equivalently to the price that the individual firm faces. So the two quantities are different. This is the quantity of the firm. This is the quantity for all in all the market. But the prices are necessarily going to be the same. We want to now determine what is the market supply curve. In either stage one or stage two, this is a relevant um, consideration. We know that the firm itself chooses a quantity pr to produce at which mar a marginal cost is equal to price. So at any given price, the firm is going to increase its output until um, marginal cost is equal to that price. What that tells us is that the marginal cost curve for the firm is that firm's supply curve. We, in fact, talked about that in previous lectures. The market supply curve, then, is the sum of that over the firms that are in the industry. So suppose we have capital N firms in the industry, say a thousand, whatever. Then the market supply curve, for any given price, the each individual firm will produce this amount, and that implies that the total amount produced in the market will be that amount times however many firms there are, which is just a point here. So price P1 has this output for individual firm, a thousand times that for the market. What I've done here is take the marginal cost curve for this firm and sum it up horizontally over all the firms in the market. What it tells us is that the supply curve in the market is the sum, this sigma here, is a summation of the marginal cost for the individual firms over all the firms in the market. Now, it's an important um, element to recognize what kind of sum this is. It's a horizontal sum. For any given price, you take the quantity that this firm produces, plus the quantity that the next firm produces, plus the quantity that the third firm produces, add those up 
in the quantity dimension, and that gives you this, this amount right here. So it's summing up this way. Every time on the midterm, there's somebody in the class who tries to create the marginal cost supply curve for the um, market by summing vertically, taking this distance and that distance and that distance and adding them up and going this direction. Uh, that has no, no meaning. So uh, the fact that it's a sum, there's two ways you can take the sum. You're wanting to sum quantities here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Now, stage one. We have no entry or exit, and we have a fixed number of firms in the industry. We want to see what's going to happen in the industry to determine market price. The logic of how I put these graphs on, the curves onto the graphs is more important than the ultimate outcome. So work through the thought process of why these are occurring in a particular order. Again, we start with the market curve and the, the firm's curve. We start with what is given outside of the market. It's given by technology or given by the demand of consumers. The first thing is the demand for the product as a whole. How many people want to buy wheat at any given price? That is not something that the firms within the market control, either individually or as a group. That's something that's given by the tastes of consumers and what other options they have available to them for buying things. So the first element to write on here is the exogenously given demand in the market that's determined by consumers' preferences, income, and other factors. The second thing that is exogenously given that firms don't control is their individual marginal cost curve. Marginal cost curves are determined by the technology that's available to the firm, how do you produce wheat, what's involved in it, and the cost of the inputs, which all firms face the same inputs in this, in this stylized situation, highly competitive situation, um, and they can't affect those prices. So these two elements are given outside of the control of the, the market. They're not determined by the market, they're given outside of the market. From that point on, we then derive what happens in the market to end up with equilibrium price and the behavior of each firm. We know that by definition, the supply in the market is the sum, horizontal sum, of the marginal cost curves for each individual firm. So that gives us the market supply curve. That then gives us, we know just from our concepts of demand and supply, that the equilibrium price is going to be the in, in, um, interaction of the demand with the supply curve, where the supply curves the uh, sum of marginal costs. That gives us a price that's in the, um, that uh, is in the market and a quantity. Again, you can work through the dynamics of moving there. If price were higher, then farmers would be providing more wheat than can be sold, and the price of wheat's going to drop. If the price were lower, then the demand for wheat's going to be greater than the amount supplied, and the price is going to rise. And so you eventually end up at that point. Yeah. Well, okay. Here was a, this was a good point. This marginal cost curve intersects the y-axis here, and this one doesn't. It should. Uh, that's just uh, messy graphing. Luckily, we don't care because it doesn't, nothing's happening over there. Then, what does each firm do given this price? Well, we already know what each firm does. Each firm recognizes that its own demand curve, each firm doesn't face the market demand curve, it faces the demand curve for its own product, which is a flat demand curve at the market price that's been established. And then each individual firm will produce the quantity at which its own marginal cost is equal to that price. So each firm will end up producing more and more until it moves to that point. So the, the, this is equilibrium in stage one before there's entry and exit. Each firm will produce where price is equal to marginal cost, 
and um, choose the quantity at which its marginal cost has risen to price. And then the total amount in the market will be where the demand curve intersects the horizontal sum of the marginal cost curves. Notice, we get our first astonishing result. In this, even without free entry and exit, with just lots of firms and homogeneous products, because we're in stage one where we've got a fixed number of firms, we just have lots of them, and each firm produces the same product, so each firm knows it has a flat demand curve. If it tried to raise its price, no one would buy from it. What we get is the market price is equal to marginal cost for each individual firm, okay, which implies that the marginal willingness to pay for each person is equal to marginal cost, which, as you saw last lecture, as how you explained, that's the socially optimal level of output. Who would have thought? Why does this occur? It's not that the market moves to that point because anyone cares about that point that's in the market. Everyone's trying to just optimize for themselves. But given a particular price that is in the market, we know how that price gets established by the interaction of demand and supply. Consumers, as we know, will always buy the good as long as their marginal willingness to pay exceeds the price. Notice, remember that demand curve is equal to marginal willingness to pay curve. It's the same thing. So consumers start buying a little bit of it when their marginal willingness to pay is greater than the price and continue buying and buying and buying and buying until their marginal willingness to pay is equal to that price. And then they quit buying anymore because after that their marginal willingness to pay is less than the price. Notice that this is true not just for the market as a whole. It's not like marginal willingness to pay in the market because that has no meaning. But the marginal willingness to pay of every single customer Every single customer has bought an amount of wheat that they want, or bread, or whatever you know, this is demanded for, um, until their willingness to pay for one extra unit is exactly equal to the price, and they quit buying any more. This is in itself is interesting. All of us have different preferences. Some people care more about one thing than another. Some people care more about bread. Some people care more about rice. Different things. But in a market system, when each person is consuming the quantities that they want, we end up on the margin all having the same marginal willingness to pay because we've all optimized to that point. It's not that we all start out with the same marginal willingness to pay, but we all consume whatever quantity it takes for us to move to where our marginal willingness to pay is equal to the price. And just think about it. What if your marginal willingness to pay was greater than the price? You'd buy more of it. If your, pri if your marginal willingness to pay was less than the price, you'd buy less of it. So essentially, every individual person is making their own decisions that end them up with the marginal willingness to pay. So it ends up that everyone in this room has the same marginal willingness to pay for a product that is priced in the market that you're buying, even though we all have exceedingly different preferences. And the reason we get, and the way we get there is we have different levels of consumption. A person who likes bread a lot more than rice will buy a lot of bread until their marginal willingness to pay drops sufficiently to the price. A person who doesn't like bread compared to rice will buy lots of rice, not buy much bread, but then continue buying bread only a small quantity because then their marginal willingness to pay has dropped to the, to the price. Okay. Um, so this, this is an astonishing result in something that is, uh, seems paradoxical, that even though we all have different preferences for goods, in a market system where we're all facing the same prices, on the margin, our willingness to pay is all the same. So that's happening on the demand side. On the supply side, exactly the same thing is happening in reverse. Each firm is not trying to do anything that's socially beneficial. They're simply increasing their production until their marginal cost is um, equal to price, and hence they can't make any extra profit. They continue making increasing production when they can make profit from doing so, and quit when they can't do it any further. What that means is that every firm ends up at the same marginal cost, equal to price. 
So the marginal cost of every single firm is equal to the marginal willingness to pay of every single consumer. And there is no way you can be better off than that from a social perspective. The uh, way to think about that again is in reverse. Suppose we were at a point where marginal willingness to pay of some consumer is greater than the marginal cost of some firm. If that were the case, then there's some consumer out there that's willing to pay more than a firm needs to be compensated to produce the good. And from a social perspective, we should produce more of the good. That consumer should buy a good, a unit of good from that, that a producer. And both would be better off. Um, so we should expand production. If instead the marginal willingness to pay for some consumer is less than the marginal cost for all firms, then, the fir then everyone would be better off by producing less of that good and the, the, um, the, uh, c the consumer spending money on something else instead, returning that money to the person and they're spending it on something else. The only point at which you cannot make people better off is when marginal willingness to pay for each person is equal to the marginal cost of each firm. And that's the genius of competition, that by individual people taking the prices given and optimizing towards that, and each firm taking the prices given and optimizing towards that, we end up at a social optimum. Okay, one thing to note here, when we're in stage one, this quantity here is exactly equal to that quantity times however many firms you've got in the market. Important to recognize because we're going to deal with that a bit later. Now, um, in stage one, we haven't talked any about profits, and this is where stage two starts to become relevant. In stage one, when there's a fixed number of firms, the equilibrium price that has been established could end up with positive profits or negative profits for the firms. I've drawn a case here where you have interaction of demand and supply, and that reads over to give a price for the individual firm. The firm chooses a quantity at which marginal cost is equal to that price right there. And as you can see, the price is greater than the average cost curve of the firm. So the firm is making this amount of profit per unit, the difference between the price per unit and the average cost per unit, times the quantity that it sells. This box right here is a graphical representation of the profit that the firm is making. Notice, as was pointed out last lecture, the marginal cost curve always goes through the minimum of the average cost curve. So since we're on the part of the average cost curve that's, that's over here, um, above the minimum, that means that the price is greater than average cost, and average cost is higher than its minimum. Okay. So this is an example that I've just drawn in which the marginal cost, uh, the um, firms are making a profit. You could also draw an example. All I'm doing here is notice that none of the analysis we've done depends on average cost. None of the stuff I've done so far looks at average cost. It uses the marginal cost curve only. So let's just shift up the average cost curve. There's nothing in our analysis that, um, that uh, would change. The equilibrium price is going to be the same because this is the sum of the marginal cost curves. All I have is a higher average cost, which results maybe from higher um, fixed costs. Notice that the new average cost curve, the marginal cost still goes through the minimum of the average cost curve. So I've shifted it up and shifted it along the marginal cost curve. But now this same price gives a price that is lower than the average cost to the firm at the quantity that the firm's choosing. And so each firm loses money. The firm loses the difference between the price and its average cost at the quantity that it's choosing. That's the loss per unit times the number of units it's selling gives you the, um, the uh, total loss. So in stage one, we get social optimality, but firms can make positive profits or make negative profits. Um, and those can be desirable or undesirable from a social perspective, depending on how you want to look at it. But that's what generates the movement in stage two. So now, let's go to stage two, where firms can now enter and leave the market. We don't have just a fixed number of firms. 
We want to see what happens when firms enter and leave the market. Well, if you saw a market that was making lots of profits and you could enter that industry, you might incur some costs in doing so, but you could borrow the money because you could always, if you have to leave, sell your fixed costs and recoup it, free entry and exit. What would you do? You'd enter the market. There, or if you're too timid, then there would be other entrepreneurs who would be willing to. So if we start out with a situation as I described in the first graph, where the interaction of demand and supply for the fixed number of firms gives us a price that is greater than the average cost at the quantity that's being produced, so the firms are making a profit, that's going to mean that new firms are going to enter the industry. There are going to be entrepreneurs out there wanting to make profit. They see, ah, there's a profit opportunity. I can enter. I can produce things just as cheaply as the firms that are in the industry. I can sell them for exactly the same price as those firms in the industry, and so I'm going to enter. What happens when more firms enter the industry? What happens is, recall that the supply curve in the industry is the sum of the marginal cost curves over all the firms that are in the industry. If we've now got more firms in the industry, we're summing over more marginal cost curves. So the supply curve gets shifted out. This is maybe the sum over 1,000 firms. Now we've got a sum over 1,500 firms because 500 more have entered. So what has happened is it's simply moved out. For any marginal cost curve, we're now summing it up over more firms. Then what happens? So all these entrepreneurs who are out there see, ah, oh, there's profits being made. I want to get some of those too. They enter the industry. The first thing that happens, of course, is that at the given price, now there's too much supply. All these new firms have entered, anticipating making profits, and they supply more than can be sold at that price. That puts downward pressure on the price, and the price drops to its new equilibrium. But as I've drawn it, all the firms are still making a profit. They're still pricing at greater than marginal cost, uh, greater than average cost. The quantity that they're choosing to produce, the price is greater than the average cost. So they're still making a profit. If there's still profits to be made, firms will still enter. And so you get the shift outward in the supply curve even further until, I've done it in three successive jumps, until at this point, the equilibrium price now no longer allows a profit. The firms end up with zero profit that are in the industry. Um, the price is equal to marginal cost. Okay? So the firm is choosing the level of output at which marginal cost is equal to price, but the price is so low that it's actually also equal to the average cost curve, average cost. Essentially what's happened is we've moved backwards on this marginal cost curve, down, 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 making less and less profit each time because it's the difference between marginal cost and average cost that gives us profit. The firm moves backwards on its marginal cost curve until it gets to this point where it's now making zero profit. Okay. Um, notice a seeming paradox here also. The amount produced in the market is rising, and the amount produced by each firm is dropping. That's because the number of new firms in the industry is rising faster than the diminution in output of each individual firm. That's not contradictory. Each firm is now facing a lower price, and so it rationally chooses to produce less. And it ends up here. You could have started this process in the opposite direction. Do I have a graph for that? No. Um, you could have started this process in the opposite direction, where you start out with a supply curve out here with lots of firms. Each firm then loses money. What happens when firms lose money? They go out of business. That causes the supply curve to shift inward, because there are now fewer firms there. And essentially, you shift back to this point right here. In those situations, you'd, each firm would be on its marginal cost curve at any given price, below its average cost. It'd be losing money. As firms leave the industry, notice that 
This firm's not doing anything. An individual firm's not doing anything to get rid of his competitors. He's just, this firm is just sitting there watching the price. The firm is losing money at the existing price. As other firms happen to leave, the firm observes the price in the market rising and produces more and more and more until we get to this equilibrium where there's zero profit and no firms entering or leaving. Did you? No? It looked like you had an issue. Okay. We got it. What the equilibrium then is, the equilibrium in a purely competitive market after we've allowed free entry and exit can be described in this fashion. The demand curve for the market is given exogenously. The marginal cost curve for each firm and the average cost curve for each firm is given by technology that's outside of the system. In equilibrium, we don't need to show all the other rigmarole now of how we got there. We know that the firm, that the price is eventually going to move to the minimum of the average cost curve where marginal cost intersects average cost. So the price is going to be here. The total amount produced in the market is going to be whatever's demanded at that price. Each firm is going to produce where its marginal cost is equal to that price, which since that price is the minimum of the average cost curve, it's also producing where its average cost is equal to that price. And the total amount in the market is going to be, again, read right off the demand curve. How many firms are there going to be? The number of firms is actually determined within the system by the relationship of this curve to this curve. This quantity divided by that quantity has to be the number of firms that is in the, firm, in the market in equilibrium. So the way you can tell how many firms are going to be in the market in equilibrium is to find the minimum of the average cost curve, what price is the lowest average cost that the, what, what is the lowest average cost that's possible for a firm to, um, to uh, incur? Um, what is the quantity at which that minimum average cost is, uh, is occurring? That gives the quantity for each firm. That also gives the price that will eventually occur in equilibrium. And then read off how much is demanded at that price. That gives you the quantity in the market. Dividing that quantity by that quantity tells you what the number of firms in the market is. Who would have thought competition is so complicated? All these rigmaroles and everything. Um, you know, we think of it as just this wonderful thing, but it's actually, hang on just a second, we've got two more minutes. Wonderful, um, very complicated, very subtle, and very elegant. It's just the more you look at it, it's even more beautiful. What this then gives us is the following results. We have marginal willingness to pay of each consumer is equal to price. That's because each firm is taking the price, each person is taking the price as given and consuming as much as they want to, which ends up on the margin, their willingness to pay is equal to the price. Each firm, as before, in stage one, it continues in stage two, each firm is increasing its output until its marginal cost is also equal to that price. So we have marginal willingness to pay is equal to marginal cost, that's social optimality. We also have production at the minimum of the average cost, at the, on the average cost. So each firm is, is covering its costs, no more and no less. And price is equal to the minimum of the average cost. It's not just that it's the average cost at that quantity. This happens to be the minimum average cost. So each firm is producing the cheapest possible way for um, um, producing it on a per unit basis. And profits are zero. This could be considered a desirable social outcome because it's no transfer of money from consumers to producers. All that's happening is producers are getting their costs covered, they cover their average costs, and that's it. Who would have thought that you could have a simple system like this with price equaling everything that's relevant in the market? Marginal willingness to pay, marginal cost, average cost, and the minimum of average cost all simultaneously. Okay, come back next week or next Wednesday. We'll talk more about it. Thank you.